Hello, my name is Kavita Gupta. Welcome to Nest Summit for Climate Week 2020 from Javits Center. Today we have Alexandria Viasenur. Did I get it right, Alexandria? <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. I mean, Alexandria is 15 year old climate activist, organizer, and founder of Earth Uprising. Mm -hmm. And just for anyone who is thinking, this is a socially distanced conversation, more than six feet as per New York standard. So, Alexandria, you started the whole journey of climate activism mm -hmm. because of the fires in 2018 in Davis, mm -hmm. right, yes. in California. Yeah. And unfortunately, this repeated, the history repeated itself this year and you were again trapped in Davis and in fires till yesterday or day before. Mm -hmm. Please walk us through what's been happening and I'm so sorry to hear that you, were, you haven't been feeling well. Yeah, so first of all, for a little bit of background, um, the reason I got involved in climate activism in the first place is because of California's wildfires. So I am originally born and raised in Northern California, um, but at the time in 2018, I was living in New York City with my mom while she pursued her master's degree. And so I would go back and forth quite a bit to California and New York. Um, and so one time during Thanksgiving, I ended up going and visiting family back in Northern California. And during that time, the Paradise Fire happened in Paradise. Um, quickly became one of the worst wildfires in California's history. Um, but it may be topped because of what's happening in recent um, weeks. Um, and so what happened to Paradise was, of course, very devastating. And um, my hometown was very close to that. And we ended up receiving a lot of the smoke from that wildfire. And your hometown is? Davis, Davis California. Yeah. And so I have asthma, and it was making me really sick. The smoke was seeping into my home. I had to roll with towels, put them under windows and doors to keep oh. the smoke from coming in. And so my family decided to um, send me back to New York City early from that trip for my health and safety. And that was one of the main motivators that made me start seeing climate change and start researching about it. And so what's really upsetting is that these events are happening again, and they will continue to happen in California. So. California has had wildfires um, the past three or so weeks, and I was there when they first started. Um, the LNU complex fire is the one that I was very close to. And so just as we thought it was getting better, we ended up having another fire that started that is now at 150,000 acres, and it's 0% contained. Oh, wow. And so I was um, very grateful and privileged to be able to come back to New York City early from that. Um, and I got here just a couple of days ago. And so I'm, of course, very worried because a lot of my family is still in California um, and my friends are still there. And now the whole entire West Coast is on fire right now. And so I think that that is one of the main reasons why we must strive for climate action and, because that is just going to happen more and more. And that is, of course, something we must prevent. And this has become like an annual thing because of this climate change. I mean, this is a proof that like, mm -hmm. You know, it is happening, it's touching us and impacting day-to-day -day lives. And yeah. not everyone is fortunate enough to like leave their houses and move around. Um, yeah, I completely agree. But let's take a little bit step back. I mean, you started missing classes once a day, uh, one, sorry, once a week, you will miss school and you will go outside UN and you mm -hmm. would protest. How did that journey start? Yeah, so after I saw the effects of the wildfire in California, and I started researching, I knew that I had to do something. And so I started to pay attention to Greta Thunberg and her actions, and I saw her speak at COP24. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the epiphany moments, as you would call it. And I decided that I had to do something. And so I took all of the anxiety, climate anxiety and eco grief that I was feeling, and I turned it into action by going and striking in front of the United Nations. I started on December 14th of 2018, mm -hmm. and I striked every Friday all the way up until the beginning of the pandemic in March. Oh, wow. And so it was, um, it was great to see the movement has grown and we're now going to change in this pandemic, of course. Um, it's such a bold move. Like when we think of like, when we think of students, we think of only like schools and SATs, parties and friends. Um, <laughs> What was the support system like from your parents, from your friends, school union, teachers, etc.? Well, when I first brought the idea to my parents and I told them that I'm going to go on strike on Friday and um, the first couple of minutes we kind of just laughed because 
the idea was so foreign. Um, I had never been involved in activism before that. That was my first form of activism was that strike. And so the idea of protesting was just so new to me. Mm -hmm. And so after I talked with my parents about it, they were very supportive, of course, because um, they saw how important this was to me to do something. Because when you take action and you strike, it really helps a lot with everything you're feeling around the climate crisis. And so my friends as well, they, at first when I started striking, they didn't really understand why it was important. And so it was really up to me to educate them on why I was doing this. And so after a while, after a couple of um, strikes, they ended up understanding and um, some of them have even gotten involved in activism in their own ways. Did any one of them join you on those Fridays? Um, some of my friends in New York City did. Um, some of my friends in California actually ended up joining my organization Earth Uprising in city groups. Wow. How many city groups are there for Earth Uprising now? Um, we have groups all across the country. Um, there are city coordinators. We also have um, ambassadors in all around the world, so in over 30 countries. This is like an amazing grassroots movement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all climate associated. And what do they do? Do they talk to corporates, lawmakers, like what do they want to achieve and how? So the main mission of Earth Uprising is education. So after organizing Global Climate Strike Days, uh, all the way from March to September, um, I saw just how important it was to get young people out protesting. And I even realized that a lot of young people weren't striking or taking action because they didn't understand why it was important. So Earth Uprising was founded on the principle of educating young people peer to peer through that mobilizing for direct action. So in our city groups here in the United States, what we're doing is we are having school clubs, uh, school programs where young people educate each other about the climate crisis. Because I've noticed that when young people talk to another young person, it gets them so much more motivated and passionate to get involved. And you recently did a project with GAP, if I'm not wrong, and mm -hmm. Be the Leader. But instead of just endorsing, you actually went through a whole diligence process and finding your comfort zone before yeah. you actually endorse them. That's super impressive. And um, kudos to GAP, kudos to you. Tell us more about it. Yes, so um, the GAP campaign, I was um, very grateful to be a part of that. But of course, when working with any brand, it's important to look at their practices. Um, one thing that I've took a focus to a lot during these past couple of months is if we're always pushing for systematic change, we must also push that from corporations and brands. And so GAP came to me, um, and I also was um, very inquisitive with sustainability around all sorts of brands. And I started to see that they were starting to take a step forward. And so I got behind that, and I really wanted to push the sustainability that they're doing, make them go a step farther. And so I think that as activists, if we're pushing brands to do something, we need to push them to be sustainable and then show that as a format to other brands that they need to start doing the same. Wow. Um, so how long did the process stay and like, what does it entail? Like, are they going to make any changes, any substantial things? Yes, so um, with GAP, uh, it took a couple of months um, I, talking with them about what they were doing. And so after really pushing them on their sustainability, they ended up changing their practices and they have this line where they um, have sweatshirts and clothes made from recycled water bottles. And so um, what I think is really important is that they are participating in the circular economy. Wow. And do you see yourself working with more brands or do you see like creating some sort of standards for people to go with? I definitely see myself working with more brands. I want to make sure that what Gap did happens with other brands because right now um, a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions come from companies all around the world and so they need to start changing their practices and especially um, one thing I found is that brands and corporations, they are much more likely to move the needle than governments because they actually have the people pushing them. And I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos this past year, and that's something that I really noticed is that they were committing to um, reducing their emissions and making changes because actual young people were pushing them to do that. Mm. And uh, you just touched base upon how lawmakers work. You were recently there for DNC, you spoke at DNC. Mm -hmm. What was the experience? How did it come about? It was a very inspiring speech, by the way, anyone who hasn't seen it. <laughs>
We were visiting family nearly 100 miles away, but my asthma flared badly. I could hardly breathe. I'm Alexandra Vissignor, and I've been organizing young people around climate change since 2018. Climate change is impacting us now, and it's robbing my generation of a future. For young people my age, every aspect of our lives, from where we go to school, to what kind of careers we'll have, to whether or not we can raise a family. Thank you. Um, I was able to speak uh, during the Democratic National Convention, and I thought that it was very important that they focus on climate change because climate change is the number one voter issue for young people. And so it's very important that we have a candidate that's actually believes in the science, first of all. And so I was just happy to be able to be there and share the message with so many other people. And I received great feedback. I saw more young people actually get involved with Earth Uprising and other organizations after they saw climate change on this national platform. So if, let's imagine, the next government is completely open for uh, working with you on climate change, what would be your top three policy suggestions for them? Uh, who exactly? The government, like the US government? government, let's say whomsoever get mm. elected next, yeah. is ready to go forward and make all the changes you ask them to. Yes, so I think that that is very important. Um, I've actually been working with the Biden campaign on the um, climate plan that they, are, they have. And so I think the first thing that's very important is the United States transitions to renewable energy 100% by um, 2035. And so that's a very tight deadline, but it needs to happen. Um, and as well, I think that focusing on equitable solutions, we are already seeing the effects of the climate crisis, for example, in California. And so we need to focus on helping communities that are the most vulnerable. And so we can't have a president who is not aiding millions of people affected by climate change like in California. We need somebody who will step up and actually take actions to protect those affected. True. Um, let's. Let's take a step back from politics. Let's go to the corporates. I think um, that's a very interesting topic nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. I think what I really found very fascinating when you talked about how, like, I was there when you were speaking at World Economic Forum for Salesforce and, oh. like, uh, other initiatives. When you see corporates really trying to do sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. Are there areas which you still think, like one or two areas where most of these corporates can really push and can have a huge impact on the world altogether and not just US? I definitely think that a lot of these corporations have such a large reach and I think that they need to start educating their consumers about climate change because they are able to reach so many people about what's happening to our planet that they have a commitment to telling all these people about what's happening to our planet. and so. Um, I recently was able to talk with IKEA as well and I told them that they have to start educating people around them about what's happening because they have that platform and then also look at their practices, change their practices, become more sustainable and that's my message to all corporations um, as well as incorporating youth voices. I think that that's especially important because inter intergenerational dialogue is especially important in this very moment. Wow. So I have a fun question for you. You know how all universities endowment are not really going 100% green from their investments. So when you would be going to university, would that be your diligence process for them? I think wherever I go to university, um, I will make sure that they are um, not invested in fossil fuels, that they divest. Um, and especially if I do end up going to a place, I will consistently push them from the inside, I think that divesting is very important. Um, uh, and so I've seen a lot of these um, young people at colleges who are actually inside the system, inside the school system. And they, for example, there's a group that ended up crashing um, uh, one of the big football games at their university. Um, and they were demanding that their university divest. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is a great way to push universities from the inside. So divesting is very important to my generation when we're looking at colleges. No, absolutely. And even like games, uh, slowly and slowly, big and big football stadiums are coming mm -hmm. and saying we are going plastic free. Yeah. Right? Because the young generation expect that. <laughs> so I feel something which you said is absolutely right on the court that um, consumers can mm -hmm. demand and then the corporates yes. would deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so are you doing a lot of these programs under, your, uh, under the organization Earth Uprising to basically 
teach these young activists or people who are just interested in it to mm. know what is the power of their voices? Definitely. I think that it's very important to teach young people about activism. And so that's going to be a part of the curriculum that we have in schools is teaching young people historical movements and what brought change, but especially teaching them right now what they can do to be an activist and make their voices heard. Um, giving them an intro to the youth climate movement, finding the spaces that they feel like their voices are going to be heard the most. Yeah. So I think that when young people are taught about activism and um, are just given um, more of a guide through it, it helps them so much more. Um, when I first got involved in activism, I didn't really have an idea of what I was doing. I had a lot of learning to do. I learned as I went, and so the mentors that I found meant so much to me. And so I think that with this curriculum, what we're trying to do is make it so much easier for young people to get involved so they don't struggle as much, and making their voices heard is more accessible. Wow. So going back, when you, when you just started protesting, mm -hmm. um, I want to come back to your parents a little later, but first, um, were there times when things were really difficult or people mm -hmm. were not supportive and you just had to, you know, persist and get through? Like, are there stories which when you look back, you're like, oh, whatever. I think that um, there have definitely been a couple of people that I've had to really push. Um, you know, the main thing that I found that has been difficult was working with climate deniers and making sure the message is more prominent. You found them outside UN, climate deniers? Um, more through social media. Yeah. I actually found a lot of climate deniers. And so, you know, the United States is the place that has the most climate deniers in the world. Really? Um, everywhere else actually believes wow. in the science. Uh, <laughs> and so I think it's very important to teach climate change, but also find a way to communicate to climate deniers. And so I've definitely been attacked by trolls and by climate deniers through social media. Um, one time I was put on Breitbart when I first started activism and I ended up getting death threats um, in the comment section of the article. And so I... And this is Steve Bannon's newspaper we are talking about. Um, he I was the editor for Breitbart, if I'm correct. Okay. Yeah, in the comment section there are so many um, trolls who end up um, putting out death threats and so it's very important for activists to look at their safety. How old were you when those were coming? <laughs> I was just 13 actually. Wow. Um, so I'm 15 now so not much of a difference but it feels like it's been ages. Wow. How did your parents cope with that? Um, my parents were definitely worried of course um, and I'm very lucky because they're so supportive and they ended up making sure I was safe. Um, after the Breitbart article, article came out and I started to receive more climate deniers and trolls, um, they ended up coming to the protests and just being someone there just in case anything happened. Um, because it is very important to have um, adults there at protests because um, they can make sure that we're safe, that we um, are protected because at protests um, you're never really sure what can happen. And so just having people who can um, really guide you through it is very important. Yeah, but like having two kids, having their own professional, personal life and then being involved. Um, I, I should say you're very fortunate to have such supporting parents. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure a lot of us around there can say the same. Um, how do you see like the balance going forward as you mm -hmm. are now more and more? I mean, Pride Bar happened, but you are more and more in news. You are a very, you are at forefront of climate mm -hmm. activism, and you're still underage. How do you see the movement going? I see the movement definitely growing, um, and I think the pandemic actually gave us an opportunity to grow. Um, when this first started, we started having more conversations about our movements, um, what really made it impactful, and how can we incorporate. Um, more of an intergenerational collaboration, but also make sure the, that um, the Black Lives Matter movement is also incorporated, that we have people impacted the most at the forefronts. And so we had a lot of reflection, but now coming out of it, I think that we are really changing the way we're organizing and making it more intersectional and diverse. Wow. Do you think you would ever want to go to college? Like, you can start teaching? <laughs> uh, I definitely do want to go to college. Um, <laughs> There is definitely a couple aspects that interest me. Um, being a law student, maybe. Um, and mm. so 
I've definitely been thinking about all of the options that I can take, but I definitely want to stay in social justice areas because I think that you know, we have so much going on, especially with climate change becoming more um, serious, that I always want to be in this area and be an advocate. Uh, um, uh, we should really use this platform to thank David, your dad, and Kristen, right? Your mm -hmm. mom. I think amazing job, really amazing job. Um, what can people, what can youth do across the world? People who can do 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, if mm -hmm. they have limited, limitation on time, limitation on parental support, can't really skip school and go, uh, which is very courageous, by the way. Uh, how can they be part of it? I think that there are so many different ways for youth to get involved. And um, I think first, if they have time, the first thing that they should do is, of course, educate themselves. That's a very accessible thing that they can do. And then from there, look at their community find out how they're being impacted by the climate crisis because that is one of the main motivators that makes people want to be involved and so after that after you know your climate story then you can figure out what you really want to do about that do you want to work in policy um, to make sure that you um, you're protecting your community do you want to go into direct action uh, and so I think that once you find out where you want to go into in the movement then look for an organization or a group that you can join join to make your voice heard and so, as well, another resource to young people is social media. Um, my generation has this vast area of technology that we have been using to our advantage. And so definitely um, use social media and push out your message and put pressure on your politicians through social media as well. Yeah. But I think a lot of people still face, as you talk about the whole bullying and like, mm -hmm. you know, deniers and people who are just haters, right? Yeah. Um, social media does open up to a lot of unwanted uh, uh, opportunities, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, is something which Earth Uprising doing, like let's say somebody who is sitting in Nigeria, in mm -hmm. Lagos, and wants to open up a chapter, wants to be part of it, yeah. what do they have to go? Mm -hmm. uh, just go to our website earthuprising.org and um, send us an email and we have a place for everybody. I think that in this movement everybody is welcome and everyone is needed to in order to get climate action and so um, we have focused internationally making sure that um, countries that are being affected by the climate crisis have a voice and have a group because um, I think it's very important that activists are there on the grounds saying what needs to happen in their community. Um, is there any secret society of you, Greta, and a couple of other people which we don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if there is, even I don't know about it. <laughs> um, we, we just need an invitation. We're not going to share it with everyone else. <laughs> the, uh, the one thing about the youth climate movement that I'm very grateful for is the sense of community that it has. And so through social media, I was able to connect with activists all around the world. So we organize and we communicate with each other through technology. So um, WhatsApp, Discord, Instagram, Twitter. We don't really use Facebook that much. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that the, the community that we have built is the reason why a lot of us are still able to organize because a lot of young people go through activist burnout and we need the support system and people behind us in order to continue organizing. And this group provides, let's say, somebody need a lawyer, somebody need uh, some different type of support in the local community. Do you have like a big support community around it? I've definitely found support from places that I didn't really expect it. Um, and so there's definitely been areas where um, putting out a call through social media, we found people when we needed them. Uh, I don't think I've worked with any lawyers yet, <laughs> but I know I that hope you don't need one. <laughs> uh, I hope that, um, that there's just so many people who want to get involved from different areas of our society. And so there's really no limit of a person of what they could be involved in. Um, and their job can be for them to support activism or get involved. Wow. So my last question to you, call for action. What, like, as you said, what's happening in Davis, what's happening around the world. Uh, I think we all have seen climate change, the impact firsthand, especially mm -hmm. people who live in coastal areas, right? They yeah. are like feeling it. It's more than 100 degree temperature in California right now. It's burning. Um, so if you have to have a call for action for everybody who's out there, what would that be? I think the first call to action to young people is 
um, especially here in the United States, the election coming up is going to be the climate election. And so I think that it's very important for young people to go out and make sure that they vote. And if they're too young to vote, like myself, um, just get involved in the movement and make sure your voice is heard because you can still be involved in the political system even if you're underage. Tell your brother, tell your sister, tell your mom, tell your dad, your grandparents, go and vote. Exactly. Um, and I also think another important thing is to um, talk to your community about climate change. Right now, I think that that is especially important because we are seeing the effects of the climate crisis all around the world. And so talking to your community is very important and finding other people who can join your movement that you want to create. Wow. Thank you so much, Alexandria. Thank you so much for coming here. I'm so sorry for what's happening back at your hometown. But I think call, like actions like this, getting a community like this will hopefully really, really change everything. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me today.